Blessed be the name of the Lord. Today I want us to <clears throat> um, answer this question, how will God judge me? Many, many years ago, I closely encountered a couple who had a relative that was facing a criminal trial. He was on trial for murder. And I can vividly recall the tremendous stress that this man and his wife were going through as their relative were facing that trial. He was in jail and he was being brought before um, the courts every day, of course, during that trial. This man and his wife, they, they were losing sleep. They were tremendously stressed. Their appetite was gone. And you could tell how, how much pressure they were facing as, um, as they were going back and forth into the city to witness this trial. But if they were facing so much stress, can you imagine this young man who was on trial, what he was experiencing? Here he is brought in um, with handcuffs every day, sitting in this courtroom, facing a judge who has his life in his hands, his future in his hands. Now he could walk free at the end of the trial if there is inadequate evidence to convict him or if the judge decides to call this a mistrial. He could probably be released under certain conditions or he could be jailed for a specific time or even life imprisonment. Worse yet, he could face the death penalty. This man's life is hanging in the balance. It is resting upon the decision that that judge is going to make at the end. Now, you and I may never be in such a position, but we will all stand before the judge of all the earth, the God of heaven and earth. The Bible tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, there is the judgment. And my question today is, how will God judge you? How will God judge me? Today, I want us to focus on what is called the great white throne judgment. And I want to say that God is the final judge. He will judge every man on this earth. We will be in the book of Revelation chapter 20. And I want you to open your Bibles, please, and turn to Revelation 20. We will learn in this passage that God is going to judge Satan. He will judge the saints and he will judge the sinner. The three S's. He will judge Satan, he will judge the saint, and he will judge the sinner. Unfortunately, I can't deal with all three of those today, but I'm going to deal with just two of them, Satan and the sinner. We're picking up our series today at the end of the millennium. If you remember, we started a series on the end times, and we looked at the signs of the end times. Then we looked at um, the rapture. We looked at the tribulation period. We looked at the Antichrist and the false prophet. We looked at Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. Then we also looked last week at the millennium, 1,000 years of peace the peaceful reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now at the end of the millennium, something is going to happen. God begins to judge. Everyone is going to be called to the great white throne judgment. Let's look first of all at the judgment of Satan. Now not only Satan will be judged, but his cohorts. The Antichrist and the false prophet. We read in chapter 19 of Revelation, verses 19 and 20, And I saw the beast... If you look into your Bibles there, chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 19. I saw the beast. Who is the beast? The beast is the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. They were gathered to make war against Jesus and the army that was coming with him, the heavenly host. And the beast, that is the Antichrist, was captured. And with it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done... Um, the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two, look at this now, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So we read here that the, the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet, they will be judged by God. They are thrown alive into the lake of fire. They are captured. The false prophet who deceived the world, who forced men and women to receive the mark of the beast. And by the way, the mark of the beast is not a vaccine. It is not the COVID-19 vaccine. Please 
And beloved, please, Christians, I beg you, do not be deceived by false news. Do not um, go after all these news that are floating around on Facebook and whatever social media posts you may see. Check out your facts and do not um, fall for these things. The, the false prophet who had made people worship the image of the beast. The Bible tells us that they were thrown alive into the lake of fire. So the cohorts of Satan are judged and they are thrown into the lake of fire. Now what is going to happen to Satan? We read in chapter 20 of Revelation. I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Not the lake of fire. And a great chain. He had this great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the pit, and he shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. So... The same time that God judges the Antichrist and the false prophet and he places them alive into the lake of fire, Satan is also bound at that time and he is put in the bottomless pit. He is chained, chained in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And that is at the start of the millennium. And so we have the thousand years of peaceful reign of Jesus on the earth. Jesus ruling and reigning from Jerusalem with all the saints. There's peace on the earth. All the nations, they're not at war anymore. Um, um, worship is restored. There's peace, there's prosperity, there's health and strength to everyone. But then look at this. We get to something quite puzzling. We get to something that we would even be shocked at. The Bible tells us when the thousand years were ended in verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison. Now you may say, what on earth is going on? Why? You were just as shocked as I was when I read this for many years. Why would God, I mean, we already got the devil. We already locked him up. Why would God have the devil released? Why would God have Satan out on parole? The most evil, the most wicked person ever, a deceiver, a liar. We got him arrested, sentenced, and jailed. Why release him? If you caught a serial killer who we know is devoid of a conscience, he's a sociopath. He has this insatiable appetite to kill. This huge propensity to inflict pain and suffering on another human being. And he takes pleasure in it. Will you let him go? No, you will want him to be locked up forever. Locked up without any, any chances of being let go and paroled. But God releases Satan. Why? Now, God does a lot of things in the scriptures that you and I may not understand. And this is one of them. But here's a possible reason. Let's see what the devil does when he's released. Now, here's the devil. He is bound up for a thousand years. He knows he's no match for, for God. Do you think that he goes and he builds a house in Timbuktu, the farthest corner of the earth, and he settles down and he says, I learned my lesson. I'm not messing with God anymore. Is that what he does? Does he go and fly off to the farthest end of the universe and, and say, I'm not getting involved with humanity any longer? No, the Bible tells us this is what he does. In Revelation 20 and 8, the Bible says he will come out to deceive the nations, once again, that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So here, he musters an army from the ends of the earth. They come marching towards Jerusalem. They're going to attack Jerusalem. Jerusalem, once again, is on the siege. Jesus reigning in Jerusalem. The saints of God reigning in Jerusalem. They're on the siege. So Satan goes right back to his evil ways. So... If God knows that the devil is going to go and do this again, repeat his actions, he's a repeat offender. Why is God doing this? And I think the answer is right there in the verses that we read. 
The answer lies in the response of humanity. What does mankind do? They were enjoying 1,000 years of peace. Not 100 years, not 30 years, not 60, 70 years, a lifespan, but 1,000 years, an entire millennium of peace, righteousness, unity, prosperity, wildlife esteem, the, the, the trees are bearing fruit, and there's no poverty, there's no hunger, there's no famine, no pestilence, no COVID-19, nothing like that is going on. Nations are not at war, everything is at peace. But yet, what does mankind do? They allow themselves to be deceived by the devil. They allow themselves to be deceived by the devil. God is showing humanity that sin, evil, wickedness, does not lie outside of us only. It lies in our hearts. Many people worry and, and they wonder and we fuss and we fume. We fret about the evil going on out there. Right now in the United States, they're in turmoil because of that um, man who was murdered by a police officer. But then we also have the response that doesn't seem to be a righteous response there's so much riot and looting and, and, and other people are being hurt as a result of the protests so we see so much evil going on in the world and many times we complain about evil going on out there but yet we respond also with evil there's not just evil out there there's evil in here there is not sin out there there's sin in here human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked the Bible tells us Sin lies in us. Man is a sinner. Man is rebellious by nature against God. That is the reason why after a thousand years of peace, man still chooses to join ranks with the devil and go against God. It's like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had everything. It was paradise. They had, it was so beautiful, so awesome. You and I would probably love to be there. But yet they decided to rebel and disobey God. Sin lies in the heart of man. But this time, Jesus doesn't have to lift a finger. The Bible says the judgment is, is quick, it's decisive. Fire came down from heaven and consumed these, those armies. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown, the Bible says, into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So all the people are being judged by God. The devil is being judged by God. The devil is taken, he's thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet were. Fire comes down from heaven. They are tormented forever, the Bible says. Satan, the adversary of God, he's finally dealt with, finally removed from planet Earth. He is judged. So we see God judging Satan, God judging the Antichrist and the false prophet, but also God judges the sinner. Mankind is also judged by God. You know, today many people try to avoid judgment. One of the things that I had to um, come to learn in Canada, as I came to Canada, I learned that people, this word judgment and judging is a very, very touchy subject. You know, if someone questions an individual or disapprove of their actions, they quickly recall in defense and they say, don't judge me. Or why are you judging me? Why are you, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I found many people who suffer from anxiety and depression, they have this sense of being judged. They think that people are judging them all the time. I think this sense that we have of being judged simply reflects our struggle with guilt and shame, our unworthiness before God. We realize that deep down in our hearts, we are just not good enough. We cannot stand and we cannot measure up to God's moral standard because God is holy, God is righteous, God is good, He is pure, He is light. But we know that within us, we just do not measure up. Within our hearts, we know that we have fallen short of the glory of God. So we feel a sense of guilt and shame. So in a sense, it is good 
However, there's a rebellious part of man that says, no, 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 don't you dare judge me. Don't you dare judge me. And that may work today. That may work in our society where we're telling people don't judge and don't judge and don't judge. Yet we still judge. We say don't judge, but yet we still judge. Because God has given us that, that mind, that, that reasoning power, that spirit whereby we can discern good and evil and we know what's right and what's wrong. So regardless of how much people will tell us that you shouldn't judge, we know we still judge. Let's just be honest with that. So it may work today, but God's judgment, beloved, is inescapable. And one of these days we're going to stand before God without excuse. The Bible tells us in chapter 20 of Revelation verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Earth fled away, the sky fled away. It's just like everything just in the universe just opened up before the God of heaven. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. All of humanity, from Adam right down to the last person to be born on earth, everyone is going to be standing before God. He will judge every man, every woman. Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot. Everyone in the world will be judged. Napoleon, all the Caesars, they will be judged. Everyone from Adam to the last person born in this world, the kings, the presidents, the religious leaders, the prophets, the pastors, the priests, the rich, the poor, the in-between, the black, the white, the yellow, whatever color you are, whatever nation you are, the Bible tells us we will all stand before God. And in verse 12 it says, and the books were opened. The books were open. Our lives are on record. Our lives are on record. Now, I don't know if God has moved into a digital record-keeping system with zettabytes of data, or he says, I kind of like books. You can have no data corruption, no viruses, no worms, no one trying to steal your data, no trying to corrupt the data, no one trying to wipe the hard drive. Bill Gates will have no option there. You know, some people today, they're afraid of Big Brother. You know, they don't want to get into um, a, a Facebook or, or, or whatever it is, social media. And they don't like smartphones because of the cameras. They think Big Brother is watching. Big Brother is watching. We've got news for you. It's not Big Brother who's watching. It's Almighty God, the Father, Big Father, who's watching. And he's recording everything in our lives. The Bible says in verse 13, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books. It's on record according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged. They were judged. Each one of them according to what they had done. Maybe the reason why people today in the world are saying, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Is that they know that they cannot withstand the judgment of God and we will fall short. Every person will be judged according to his or her deeds. God is a righteous judge. He is a just judge. He's not like some court systems in the world. We, we often hear of these horrible cases where people are sent to prison for crimes they did not commit. So many times we hear of that. Judges, police officers, they, they concoct the evidence, they put things together, they hide evidence and so on. You've got lawyers who cover evidence, they're not quite forthcoming. And judges also, and they would have these people thrown into prison. And sometimes even up to decades after they're released, the truth comes out. How many people have died as a result of that? But I want you to know that God is a just judge. He's a righteous judge. All the people, you know, one of the things I have to believe in the, in the judgment of God for is that all the evil done in the world and many people who have died and they have not faced the judgment of man, they will face the judgment of God. And that's why the Bible tells us, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. That is the reason why the Bible tells us as believers, as followers of Christ, we do not have to seek vengeance for ourselves. We do not have to do wrong to someone who has done wrong to us. No, we leave it in the hand of God. We leave it in, it may be painful and hurtful. 
It may be very, very painful to go through such an experience when you know injustice has been done to you or to your children or to someone close to you. But this is what the Bible says. In the end, God will judge. And so we can rest assured, we can rest at peace with that. That is the reason why we can forgive people who do wrong against us. Every person will be judged by the righteous judge. The wicked will not fear in the judgment as the righteous will. The Bible tells us that all mankind will be resurrected and judged. But there is a difference between the resurrections and the deaths. Let's talk about that right now. The Bible tells us that there is a first resurrection and there is a second resurrection. The Bible tells us there is a first death and the second death. The Bible tells us in Revelation 19, 4 to 6, they came to life, that is the saints of God, and they reigned with Jesus, with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection takes place at the commencement of the millennium. When Jesus returns and he's setting up his rule and reign in Jerusalem, the first resurrection takes place about that time. And it says, blessed and holy um, is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. So John is talking about the first resurrection. So obviously if there's a first, there has to be a second. And those who are part of the first resurrection will not face the second death. What is the first resurrection? It is the resurrection of the just, Jesus called it. It's the resurrection of the saints. And it occurs at the, the commencement of the millennium. The second resurrection takes place at the end of the millennium. The rest of mankind will be resurrected and they're going to be judged before God. What is the first death? Well, the first death is when we die from this earth, when we depart from this life. Those who die, we know are living and they're dying from COVID-19 or whatever, when they, that's the first death, when they die here. The second death, however, is when we are separated from God for all eternity, when people are placed into the pit of hell. And um, we see this in verse 14. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. The Bible tells us what the second death. You see, scripture interprets itself. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hades is a place where all those who do not know God, who do not know Jesus, they go when they die. Those who have not repented of their sins, those who have not turned to Jesus Christ. Their name, their names are missing from the Lamb's book of life. So the Bible tells us about this book of life. God has a record of all of us. I have a book. Every one of you, you have a book with your name in heaven. And he's going to put up that, that record when you stand before him. But it's also a special book. God has a heavenly register called the book of life. It is a roll call of all those who trust in Jesus, all those who are born again and they're living for him. It is not a collection of all the religious people on the earth, no. It is not a collection of the lists of all the church members in the world, no. It is God's heavenly register of all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, who received him as Lord and Savior, who repented of their sins, who are born again by the Spirit of God. The others, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Bible tells us they are cast into the lake of fire. Now, I've just talk, talked about something that many people cringe at. Many people hate. Many people do not want to hear. Even in the church, we do not want to hear about the lake of fire, about hell. But my friends, I want you to know today that hell is scriptural. It is there in the Bible. And it's not our option to take it out of the Bible. The doctrine of hell, this place of eternal fire and torment of the wicked dead, has been questioned repeatedly throughout the centuries. Many people ask, how can a loving God send people to hell? Bertrand Russell, an English philosopher, says, I do not myself feel that any person who is, who is really profoundly humane can believe in, a, in everlasting punishment. He's saying, you're not humane if you can consider the taunt of eternal torment. Someone may ask the question, how could a person who lived a good life suffer in hell? Some churches decide 
that it will be best to deny the doctrine of hell. It is too horrible to consider. There's some churches that teach universalism, which is saying that, well, everyone will be saved in the end. There are others who decide to teach something called annihilationism, like Jehovah's Witnesses and so on. They, they would say, well, God is going to destroy the wicked. They're going to be annihilated. They don't have to suffer for all eternity. God, here's what our response would be. God does not desire to send people to hell. Hell was not made for man. It was made for the devil and all his demons. But hell is the end of those people who reject God. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, ultimately, there are two types of people in the world. There are those people who say to God, God, let your will be done in my life. And there are those people to whom God will say, your will be done. Are you the person who says to God, Lord, let your will be done? Or are you the person who God will say, okay, well, your will be done. You rejected me. You turned away from me. You wanted it your own way. You may say, well, if, what about those people who are good? I want to ask you the question, is there anyone who's good? Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the most perfect person in the world, the sinless person, the only sinless person in the world, he says, do not call anyone good. Do not call anyone good. Only God is good. The scripture is clear. We cannot interpret the Bible according to our wishful thinking. Any faithful student of the Bible will see that hell refers to a place of eternal torment. And this is the reason why God has his preachers and teachers in the world today working, preaching, spreading the gospel, the good news. God wants you to be saved and you can avoid the torment of hell. I want to close with this story that Jesus gave us. In the book of Luke, chapter 16, reading from verses 19 to 31, Jesus, this is not a parable. This is not a parable. It's not a story he made up. It is a story he told. Not a parable, not something fictitious. He says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. And he lived in luxury every day. He probably had a mansion multiple luxury cars, a cottage, a yacht. Maybe he, he was um, going on expensive vacations several times a year. Um, you know, he's well-dressed and so on. And the Bible says at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. Not only was Lazarus poor, but he was also sick. He was also quite sick. And maybe he was also ostracized because no one wants to be around a sorry person. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. That was his therapy. That was his medicine. The time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The beggar died. And he was carried. The Bible also tells us that the rich man <coughs> also died. And he was buried. Poor man died and buried. Rich and uh, rich man died and buried. The poor man died and he was carried. In Hades, the rich man, where he was in torment. Jesus is telling us the story here. Hades, he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away. There's some people think that, well, in hell you're unconscious. No, this man was quite conscious. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He, his memory was intact because he could have recognized um, Lazarus. He could speak. He called to, to him. He said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. He was in torment. He was in anguish. He was in agony, the Bible tells us. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, remember in your lifetime, you received your good things. You had it all. You were rich. Maybe you were one of those people who mocked and scoffed at God and said, there is no God. Or I didn't need to go to church. I don't need to live for Jesus. I'm all right. I'm going to make it. While Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in agony. 
And besides all this, dear, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. But Abraham is saying, listen, there's a separation here. You can't pass anymore. You can't come over. We can't go over there. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let them warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. This man now developed an evangelistic ministry in hell. He was thinking about his brothers. He didn't want his family, his relatives, to come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, he said, listen, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the preachers and the teachers. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Send someone back from the dead. Send someone back from the dead. Let them go and tell them about um, hell and heaven and so on. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And that is so true because Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And we are preaching Jesus today. We are preaching about Jesus today. And if people will not believe, even on the basis of Jesus' resurrection, what will cause people to believe in, in, um, in God and in hell in eternity? And Jesus tells us that hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. One of these days, God is going to judge us. We will be brought before the throne of God, the judgment of God. Now, I did not talk about the judgment of believers. I'll leave that for another time. He will judge Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and every person whose names are not written in, in the book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire where they will be forever, internal torment. You do not have to be in such a place, beloved. God has made a provision. God has made a way out so that we can be saved from hell. The Bible tells us God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever will believe in him we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. He died on the cross for our sins, the one who rose again. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. You can have eternal life. You can have everlasting life today if you will give your life to Jesus. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, I encourage us to continue to hold on to him, continue to live for him and serve him. Make sure we are living for God. Not that we were born again and, and we just leave it there. We want to grow and grow in His grace and knowledge. But the other thing is this. We need to tell others about Jesus. We need to share the gospel with others so that they can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ also. Lord, we thank you for the word today. We know that every one of us, we're going to stand before you, Father. We're going to be called to give an account of our lives. We'll be called to that day of reckoning. And I pray for those today, Lord, who are listening to your word and they have not surrendered completely to you. They're still sitting on the fence. Or maybe they've drifted away from you. Or they have they kept procrastinating, pushing the decision off. I ask you to touch them today in the name of Jesus. Lord, that the Holy Spirit touch their lives, bring conviction to them, and open their hearts and their eyes, God, to the gospel so they can turn to you. They can Repent of their sins, believe the gospel, and receive Jesus. I want to lead you in prayer today. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a simple prayer. It's not so much the words we say, but it's what is going on in our hearts. Would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the gospel of Jesus. You sent your son to die on the cross for my sins. I believe that I am a sinner. I need your salvation. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and help me to live for you. Help me to follow you. Help me to be, to be obedient to your word. Thank you for saving me, Lord. Father, I pray for your people today. God, that you would touch everyone. God, I pray you minister to everyone. As we're going through this series, Lord, in the end times, your word gives us hope. Your word gives us knowledge. You've given us insider information, insider knowledge, Lord, as to what's coming in the world. So we can rest assured, our heart can be at peace, that God, you are in control. 
that God, you know what you're doing. And that God, there's a great future ahead for us. We thank you, God, for being with us today. I pray for those who are sick, that God, you would touch them and you bring healing into their bodies. I pray for those who are feeling empty today, Lord. They're feeling a bit dry today in their spirit. Dear God, I ask you to refresh them and minister to them. Help your people, Lord, as we spend time with you in prayer, in fasting, and in your word. Would you strengthen us today, Lord? Let the Holy Spirit refresh us today. Father, ask a special blessing upon all the saints of God, everyone viewing, everyone listening here right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, because of the authority that you've given to me, Lord, and you've given to men of God, we are able to extend a blessing to your saints. And right now, I ask you to bless your saints in Jesus' name. You will minister, Lord, to their needs, God. Whatever our hearts desire, you promise, Lord, that when we pray, believe, we receive them, we shall have them. You said, Lord, when we delight ourselves in you, you will give us the desires of our hearts. And in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless your people. Bless their families. Bless their children. Bless their grandchildren. Bless them on their jobs, God. Bless their finances, God. Bless them in their homes, God. Let peace dwell. Let peace rule and reign in their homes. I pray against division. I pray against every spirit of the enemy that will seek to enter into homes and bring torment, bring fear, bring disease, bring sickness in. In the name of Jesus, right now, God, I pray you will touch. I pray you will intervene. Let your power rest upon lives. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' glorious name, I worship you. I thank you, God, for there is power in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You speak the word, Lord, and the waves become still. The, the storm is gone. Everything is calm in your name, Jesus. Father, I thank you for victory today. I thank you for power today. I thank you for blessing today. I thank you for protection today, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we honor you and we worship you, Almighty God. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Do have an awesome week. God is good. God is on your side. Let us rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice.